Hi. My name is JC McCauley. I'm Naisha McCauley, and, and you're, you're watching, watching AccessTV.org. Candid Conversation with Daryl Fitzgerald is a show where you will learn something new. It's a show for the courageous and want to be engaged. A show where we discuss any issue that affects the lives of people. And a show where we take inventory of our lives. Decision. Welcome to Candy Conversation with Daryl Fitzgerald. I want to welcome you back to Candy Conversations with Daryl Fitzgerald, the show of the people, for the people, by the people, for all people. We have a very powerful show uh, prepared for you today. Uh, the title of our show is called Social Graces, Diversity, Access, Inclusion, and Acceptance in Employment, Education, Business, and the Entertainment Industry. So there's a wide array of things we're going to be talking about today, and I do have a powerful lineup of guests here in the studio uh, with me. Um, the idea of what I see going on in um, the United States and America right now as it relates to um, diversity and uh, inclusion um, of people um, of, of minority background. Uh, it, it's almost like a state of alarm. There's so many things that um, are happening and what people are experiencing that I think um, this, that we need to address. And so in trying to address that, I'm, I'm entertaining this particular um, production. And uh, to give us some uh, a positive affirmation to go forth uh, in our discussion, I want to play a song by an artist named Black Moses from New York. This song is called Greatness. Time to blow, dictate from the fake. If your mom think it and say so. Affiliation mochis more. The world is waiting for picture and words of men come moving forward. Uh, let's give it to them like a fever. Hot and cold sweat, dripping from your demeanor. Trying to self-deprecation, driving past the wreck. With hard work and dedication, then you set to manifest the street walls, the product, the population. Let's reach a nation. They trying to stop us with God or Satan. A symbol, a symbol, a great tomorrow. Today's true, the crowd loves it. Your self-struggle, raise above it. How to come out of it. Instead of raising fools, it's bugging in the system, talking about how they love it. The season, the future rules, flaws, inventions discovered by blacks. The money rules, the laws of schools and teachers Great scholars, Morgan Garrett Giving me the green light to change bad habits Let's teach them, school them too Don't sell yourself short on what you knew and know was you There's enough infinitely presented Influence, you ain't done nothing but what you done They claim it's bad and they the truest My bombs flood your brain like water Current, rest assured, tidal waves of many ignoramus Slaves, finally raising glasses Sons and daughters, building restricted borders If you're conscious, you can't ignore us I'm deep, on radio waves Moses' frequency is clear Walking reception, the wonder days My career will triumph Knowledge, I pass theories Mockeries that equate you got a problem with me Makes it set in stone and sum up Lessons, Coretta stones Purchase illusions, fall from the time of love Yeah, my market skills bust Strategize and build A light, yeah, success Success fulfilled doubles and careers that's air ironic action. My slang approve it. No more waiting on here comes your quiet storm. Many miles from Lewis. 65, you con, I'm rightfully sung. I'm never wrong, son. I'm rightfully born one. Yeah, 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 yeah. A king, a king, a king. I'm the greatest, the greatest, greatest. Uh huh. Uh huh. I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a king, a king, I'm nigga. a king. I'm the greatest, the greatest. I'm the greatest. I'm a great man, great I'm man. A great man. I, said, yeah, yeah. I said yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a king, a king, I'm nigga. A king. I'm the greatest, the greatest. I'm the greatest. I'm a great man, a great I'm man. A great man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to thank uh, Black Moses for that particular uh, song of affirmation. 
That's Greatness by Black Moses, produced by Joseph Poog, written by Jonathan Moses McNeil, engineered by Jonathan Moses McNeil and Joseph Pugh, and recorded by Joseph Pugh. Uh, dealing with some of the things that uh, people who are minority and who are African American are dealing with um, in the United States as it relates to um, employment, uh, inclusion, and acceptance. Uh, the title itself, Social Graces, Diversity, Access, Inclusion, and Acceptance, uh, is pretty much a call to action. It's also a call to action for what we want and what we work for. It's also a petition for what people want and strive for. Uh, this is what most people want and need. This is what is necessary for a functioning world. There is inherent conflict, competition, adversity that is present but this is what people want and need to survive and live. Uh, we need access, we need inclusion, we need acceptance in employment, education, and business. Not necessarily, not necessarily entertainment industry, but definitely in employment, education, business, and industry. So uh, uh, I have some wonderful guests here in the studio to help in this discussion as we focus on uh, the state of uh, education uh, and inclusion in education and um, minorities in education in the United States. Um, to, my, to my left, I have a gentleman here, Mr. Marcus Harris. Uh, he's an aftercare director and Montessori assistant. I want to thank yes, you, sir. Mr. Harris, for um, being on Candy Conversations with Daryl Fitzgerald. Thank you, And I uh, we'll appreciate you being here, sir. And uh, flanked next to Mr. Harris is Erica Lynn Dawson. She's head of director of diversity and inclusion uh, at the College of Information and Computer Science for UMass Amherst. How are yes. you, uh, Ms. Dawson? It's a Dawson. mouthful. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting Appreciate me. Appreciate you being here. I believe you two have some great insights as it relates to the state of minorities in education. I think you have some good insights yes. about that. Uh, do you feel that uh, minorities are represented well in, in education from the standpoint of administration and, and educators? Um, I would definitely say minorities are not very well represented. Um, and then you have, you know, your different classifications of minorities. Um, so you have, you know, your African Americans or your brown Americans um, who they tend to get in because of quotas. Um, but throughout the year, you might see, you know, at the beginning of the year, they're hired. But the middle of the year, they were already gone and replaced with somebody else, you know, because at the beginning of the year, that quota is, you know, asked for and it's filled. But by that time, they can ease that person out. And that has happened a lot. In my, in my experience, just to add to yours, um, I found that in higher education, I wasn't hired as part of a quota. I was hired because I'm really good at what I do. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that there's that perception in higher education that comes around quite often where they're saying, hey, you're not really that qualified, but you're there. No, and then there needs to be a, a recognition that um, the skills that I bring to the workplace and the skills that other people bring to the workplace are all different. And we need each other to work together and we are very underrepresented in, in higher education people of color in general. And the, the statistics will actually attest to that, uh, just to get to some of the statistics that we have. At the State Education Resources Center in the 2014 report um, titled Minority Teachers in Connecticut, a durational shortage area technical report, uh, based on 2011-2012 data, the source being Bitterman Gray and Goldring in 2013, they do uh, some breakdowns as far as the student populations across um, um, schools. Uh, racial and ethnic composition in America's public schools uh, um, from K through 12. Mm -hmm. And uh, so in general, this is going through all American public schools okay. for this particular study. Uh, student uh, population, 54% white, 22% Hispanic, 15% black, 5% Asian, 4% other. The percentage of teachers, 82% uh, white, 7% black, 8% Hispanic, 5% other. The percentage on principals, 80% um, white, 10% uh, black, 7% Hispanic, 3% other. Um, these statistics, I don't think most people are surprised by those statistics. Anyone who actually 
knows or goes to any of, you know, looks at education across the United States and you look at the face of education, these, these numbers are, are pretty accurate. You know, these, these are accurate uh, numbers. There, are, there aren't as many African American or minorities in general who are literally going into the fields of, of education. And I pays, I want to pose a question, well, why, what is the reason do you two feel that uh, minorities uh, are not applying to become educators in, in, in educational uh, systems? I believe, I believe it's fear of shifting power. Um, mm -hmm. If you have more minority teachers, not even just African American teachers, you have a chance of children learning something different. You know, when the when the American education system has been based on learning and teaching one way, you know, um, so if we start to disrupt that, then it's going to be not as easily accepted. And and the, I can say this because when I was in Weathersfield, so you mean in terms of challenging um, the actual curriculum, right? Meaning, like if you if you when you say disrupt, like so if you're actually trying to implement a curriculum that is more diverse curriculum, more of a multicultural curriculum or uh, as representative of, let's say, um, the experiences or the histories of minorities, it's less likely to have that type of yes. impact on the When I, on when the I was teaching at um, Weathersfield, um, right. Silasine High, um, Highway, there was, um, I, had a, I had a sub for a history teacher, um, and there was a question regarding slavery that came up and everything, and, um, and, and in, in, the, in the text, it actually said it made slavery favorable for all people. Like, it made it seem like it was good, you know, for everybody. And so, so it was good for the country. Right. So right. the kids are like, oh, wow, I didn't see this. So I'm like, hold on, hold on a second. Um, and it was regarding whether or not how beneficial slavery was to everybody, including black people. And if it wasn't for slavery, but black people wouldn't be as recognized those, or whatever. Those misconceptions that you're, you're talking about. Um, are definitely relevant in the documentation and a lot of the research that was done at that period right. in time. Um, remember who was writing these books, right? right? And so I would like to I would like to say that in the way I see it is I see it as an institutional issue. Um, we think about it, and we have students that are going into these, and and I look at it from a broad perspective where I'm looking at it from more of a higher ed perspective. Mm -hmm. When students that are historically marginalized walk into an environment where they have the potential to choose anything they'd like to be their major or to be their decision, sometimes majors have barriers mm -hmm. or are things that you're not gonna that are very difficult to pass if you don't have that framework or background. And a lot of students are focused on if if there is a financial situation. They're focused on, I need, I want to be a doctor or a lawyer. Those are the main ones, right? Because we know that those are, yeah, those are places where you make a lot of money, right? I mean, computer scientists, not so much. It's not well known as much in that community, right? right. And I hope that it becomes more well known, but I think that it's the focus and it's also stems from grade school and how we're educating, how the education system works and what messages they're being given in their instruction and actually throughout their entire uh, educational history. How much of that do you think um, um, falls on the parents to help with that, like giving them different mindsets for different things, for to be a computer scientist? Because most times when right. you're growing up in a black neighborhood, nobody's worrying about being a computer scientist. Right. Yeah. You know, right. We don't have time to worry right. about the that. Fact, we have to worry about more practical. The, the fact is, is that less African Americans and minorities are literally going into the educational fields. And you would say mm -hmm. that it's because of specific types of uh, barriers, uh, educational, barriers educational, educational barriers. System. But it's yeah. also structural racism. It's, it's a structure, it's an you know. institution. So you think those it's barriers are It's an institution that is built. Well, mm -hmm. let me explain that. And, and this is just in general. When schools were created and these universities were created, they were not created for women, they were not created for people of color, they were created to educate white men. Right. So when we think about that history and how that ties into our future, 
that actually tells the story that we are doing what we are doing. And I, I'm so happy to be a part of this is changing the conversation in higher ed and, and, and actually helping it to be a more inclusive environment. And that's also trickles down because those are going to be the parents of the future. Right. And we hope that people get access to higher ed, right? All right. What I'm looking at is mm -hmm. what would like as a, as a person who is a, of, a, of African American descent, Mm -hmm. um, when people are making decisions about these specific career options and whether or not to get involved with the educational system, they're, they're, what are their real considerations? You know, um, sometimes I think there are considerations about well, if you have educational systems, okay, that are pretty much um, um, controlled um, by um, um, majority represented by um, people who necessarily do not look like you, okay who may not um, culturally understand the experiences from which you come from, okay? So it's, it can be, you know, and then think about the, sometimes the treatment that people f experience in these specific type of environments. When these, when, these, when these environments, these mainstream environments, are reflect the face of the majority, apparently the, the, uh, the, the, the white majority, okay? And you may even experience a lot of hostility as a as an employee in that work environment, there's a lot of things that may go on that's um, competitive in that environment. You may not feel as if you really are welcomed in that environment, accepted in that environment, um, you know, um, embraced in that environment. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I don't know if, if anyone here can relate to being in those kind of environments mm -hmm. and experiencing a certain level of um, let's say, um, uh, prejudice, uh, mm -hmm. ignorance, um, and things of that sort. Does anyone here, have you ever experienced anything like that? Um, I mean, as a, as, a, as a student in your own education and then as an administrator in the educational system? I'll first ask uh, you, Mr. Harris. Um, well, during my time um, being an educator in Hartford alone, or in Connecticut, I should say, um, I've taught at many different schools. Um, with uh, Silas Lee Middle School, Avon, Reggio, Crack Montessori. Um, mm -hmm. I worked in transportation for Crack starting off over 10 years ago. Um, and from just being in there, um, one, I'd like to touch on um, a question you pointed out earlier regarding why minorities don't necessarily enter as much into the education field, um, but, and it ties into this, um, a lot of times when one black person goes into something or a minority goes into something and they have a horrible, horrible experience and you know they let it know you know and it's good to be let it know so you know people can know how to carry themselves when they walk into that situation but sometimes it takes most of the population of those minorities and it makes them stay away from that you know mm -hmm. so they're like you know what i'm not going to go over there even though we can try to fight through it as much as you know more minorities go in there but they want to stay away from it um and in my schools Growing up with my background, I have a lot more real-world experience as well as school experience where most people just have book experience. Mm -hmm. um, and when they find that out, they don't like that because they feel like it puts me on an upper level past them where I shouldn't be, you know? Um, so there was times where they tried to come against me and make me seem like I was doing something other than what was happening um, just because they were jealous of how I interacted with students, how I was able to relate to them. Um, You're doing a good job. Exactly. Yeah. It can be very difficult in these environments um, when you are working differently than other people. And I can understand that from what you were saying in your personal experience. Yeah. Um, in my experience in the past, I have been in very restrictive environments, environments that really didn't see my brilliance. Mm -hmm. They really didn't see um, my worth right mm -hmm. and i think that the tone is set from the top down mm -hmm. um, i'm very blessed i work in a college my college is i have a wonderful dean her name is dean laura has and um, she really creates a collaborative environment where i feel comfortable for example um, in previous employment and previous job searches something i used to do and i always had to do was i needed to flat iron my hair mm. I would always flat iron my hair because I thought that I, I needed to flat iron my hair. When I started flat ironing my hair, I started getting jobs. When I came in with my natural hair, 
jobs weren't so abundant, right? And so here it is, I was a woman with a, two bachelor degrees and a master's degree, and I couldn't find employment at points in my life. So yes, my experience is totally different than someone else's experience, especially someone who is not from a historically marginalized community, right? right? But I know that I have strength in who I am and I was able to find those spaces and make them more welcoming. It's interesting too, um, inclusiveness in those environments is, is really um, important. I often see through the social behaviors of people who represent the mainstream. Sometimes you're not included in like you may, you know how they say birds of a feather flock together per mm -hmm. se. And you would find yourself like uh, people who are who look alike interacting a certain way amongst each other right. and communicating a certain way amongst each other, but you're, they don't do the same with you. Like, why are they not? Why, why are they not doing the same with you? It, it, it's it, very similar to the, the this phenomenon of we always hear people, and this is, I always laugh when I hear this because I always hear about everyone's black friend. Right, right. <laughs> if I go to right, someone, right. I have some people that I engage with, well, and they'll say I have black friends, but then I look at their wedding pictures, and their wedding pictures are all um, white, are are not. There's no black friends in the wedding pictures, and then I look at who was invited to the picnic to eat burgers with them as a family, and it's usually a picture of a segregated community to a certain extent and that is how we live we live in segregated communities and that's something that also ties into it because if I'm working and I'm in an employment situation and I become friendly with you I have more access to you you feel more comfortable to talk to me. If there's a problem, if there's something I, I you think that I can improve to be better, you're gonna constantly mentor me and help me to get to that next level. Right. Whereas the person that it might be alone will, might not have those opportunities because you get to watch other people being molded for positions when right. you weren't included in the conversation. It's, it's so interesting. There are people who are kind of like moving in the, in the right direction or attempting to move in the right direction you know, and, and, and not trying to, you know, generalize or de uh, demonize or, uh, you know, certain, uh, you know, uh, I mean, they can make a, a blank statement that's like a generalization or a stereotype uh, by, by no means. But, you know, we, there, even in situations where the mainstream, you'll have the people who hold the positions of power who are also the ones who are making the decisions of whether or not they're going to allow a certain amount of um, inclusivity or diversity or inclusion by minorities. So that, that's, that's also mm -hmm. another um, interesting um, uh, dynamic. And I've worked in those environments right. where it was very difficult to navigate. Um, uh, micromanaging became a, a thing of of mm -hmm. daily occurrence. Reality, right? So it's a reality, right? Mm -hmm. And um, being told that you're not as good as became a reality and it wasn't the words spoken directly it was exactly. indirectly implied right? right through there and and i would love i i think that in unconscious bias that biases that we have that are that we are not conscious of do exist but there are also conscious biases that also exist and hopefully the idea is that working throughout different strategies I think that it takes strategies to break down a right. lot of that institutionalized, right. um, those institutionalized issues that we have in these workplaces. Right. Because without a comprehensive strategy, right. you're not going to get that far. But if you bring a team of people together that all reflect reflect all different backgrounds, cultures, and ethnicities, it's, it's a powerful force. It is, definitely. That can't be well, I really appreciate um, mm -hmm. the perspective that you brought to the table. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Harris thank you. and also Ms. Dawson. <laughs> uh, thank you for being here. On that note, we're going to take a thank break here so at Candy Conversation with Daryl Fitzgerald. I'll see you right after our station break. Every bad political decision is made by a politician elected to office. 
So if you think your vote doesn't matter, just remember this. There are people sitting with politicians in a back room making deals about your future, making policies about your children, making decisions about your neighborhood. To them, you are just a vote. You are not their charity. You are not their cause. You are just a vote. Elections have consequences, and if you don't vote, you are actually voting to keep these people in power to work against you. Now, more than ever, you need to make your vote count. It is time to clear the air and vote for a mayor who is unbought, unbossed, trusted, and accountable to you, the constituent. My name is Jay Stan McCauley. I am an independent thinker, and I approve this message. I'm asking you for your vote on Tuesday, November the 5th, 2019, in the general election for mayor of the city of Hartford. For more information, visit MacaulayForMayor.com. Declare your independence from the plantation of party politics and free your political mind. The indie label Nico Star Music launches the all-female reggae-infused album entitled Queens, Queens in the, the Arena Commit Rhythm. Rhythm, having an international flair with stars like Nadine, Nadine Sutherland. Sutherland, It Takes One, Tom Hall with Tune, What You Gonna Do, Lady Anne, Anne This Year Route, China Nicole. Nicole, Amazing, and so much more. Queens, Queens in the, the Arena, Arena Commit Rhythm. Rhythm is the album that you need to get in your collection. It is but, 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 with an international flair, and it's available on all digital outlets on iTunes, Amazon, and many more. Queens in the, the Arena, Commit Rhythm. Yeah. The indie label Nico Star Music launches the all-female reggae-infused album entitled Queens, Queens in the, the Arena, Arena Commit Rhythm. Rhythm, having an international flair with stars like Nadine, Nadine Sutherland. Sutherland, It Takes One, Tom Hall with Tune, What You Gonna Do, Lady, Lady Anne, Anne, This Year Route, China, China Nicole, Nicole, Amazing, and so much more. Queens, Queens in the, the Arena, Arena Commit Rhythm. Rhythm is the album that you need to get in your collection. It is but, 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 with an international flair, and it's available on all digital outlets on iTunes, Amazon, and many more. Queens, Queens in, in the, the Arena, arena Commit Rhythm. Yeah. Welcome back to Candy Conversations with Daryl Fitzgerald. And uh, we're going to continue our conversation with this topic, social graces, uh, diversity, access, inclusion, and acceptance in employment, education, business, and entertainment industry. Um, in this particular segment, we're going to focus on um, in inclusion in employment and um, business. And um, we have some wonderful guests in the studio to help us in our discussion, even from a, a, a legal uh, perspective. I have uh, uh, Anya S. Goldsby. Uh, she's an associate attorney at Newport Pepe at Monteith PC and founder and principal at Black Esquire LLC. So I want to thank you, Ms. Goldsby, for being here. Uh, can the conversation with Daryl Fitzgerald said? We're honored to have you. Thank you, Daryl. Uh, looking forward to um, hearing what you have to say from a, a legal perspective as it relates to um, the state of inclusion in, in, work, in, in the workforce and employment from a law, legal perspective. I also have uh, in the studio uh, Andrea Mesquita. She's a children and family advocate, lecturer on homelessness, inequalities, and opportunity gap. I uh, appreciate you being here as well, uh, Ms. Mesquita. Uh, this curious, uh, uh, I'm going to ask you some, some questions. What, what are some, le some federal mandates currently in existence to promote race diversity in employment, education, and business? Sure. So, well, there are a lot of federal laws. Obviously, the Civil Rights Act is in place, and that essentially prevents employers from discriminating uh, based on race, sex, religion, national origin, and that is federal, so that means it has to be applied by all of the states um, in the United States, and there are also specific laws that are tailored specifically to Connecticut, but they tend to mirror what the federal law requires. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so um, I may also ask some questions as it relates to um, education too, because I think you have some, some definitely some background involved with that. Um, in the first segment, we talked a lot about uh, there seems to be certain considerations for promoting diversity, um, and uh, some of those things are access to opportunity, um, access to the in information about opportunity, um, actually having access to the application process, um, who is making specific decisions, who is making the hiring decisions and decisions to include uh, people at the work workforce or workplace or employment, uh, actually inclusion and acceptance, whether or not a person who's actually hired is really accepted, you know, and included uh, and in terms of that environment, if that environment is made uh, conducive, is healthy, you know, for, for people who work there. And uh, also, so that treatment, how people actually treat it when they're at the workplace. Uh, uh, sometimes people who are coming from a diverse background or, my, or minorities in the workplace have very unique experiences. And sometimes that experience is, is not one that's very um, encompassing, engaging, um, um, not um, one that is uh, is really embracing what that person who is minority or uh, of a diverse background can bring to the table. I had mentioned in the first segment how sometimes uh, when you're dealing with a mainstream or a, a mainstream or homogenous uh, group, uh, whether it be an institutional group or it could be at a company or a business, there seems sometimes where like they say, birds of a feather flock together. You may have people who just, through for whatever reason, feel more comfortable interacting a certain way with themselves. And you, you being a, a minority or a, pers a, a, a person of diversity, they're not interacting with you that same way. I mean, I don't know if that's just, right. what, have, have, can you relate to those type of experiences? Can you yes. relate to that, Ms. Goldsby? 100%, 100%. So you, so you know exactly what I'm talking about. I it's do, not, I, I live it, um, I read it every day. Um, so as you mentioned, I am an attorney, um, and specifically, I think being a black female makes it very difficult for me to navigate this legal profession because it is very male dominated and specifically very white male dominated. So most of the time when I'm going to court, when I walk into a room, a meeting, I am the only one that looks like me. I may be the only female, I'm almost always the only black female, and at my current firm, I'm the only uh, associate of color that works there. Right. And, and it's, you know, there, there are different levels, you know, there are different spaces where there, it's very, you know, it's very subtle. Um, you know, it's, um, for me, working in a nonprofit sector, a lot, you know, I, I, see, I enter spaces where I'm the only female of color. Um, and it's different. I, I think you have spaces where there's much more of a comfort level if you are, say, the client who's receiving services versus being the person who is looked to to give their expert advice or to give their expertise. Um, there's spaces where I I speak to an individual on the phone and, you know, we developed a professional rapport and then, you know, you go to do the handshake and, you know, you see the hesitation and they go, oh, and so you co you continue, um, you know, there are board meetings where I might have, I, I've, I've been on a few boards and I, I might give a suggestion or an idea and, you know, forget the glass ceiling. It's, this is like, this is something far, far greater. Um, I might say something and, you know, it's like, okay, okay. And then someone else says it, the very same thing that I just said, not even three minutes ago, but it's me, it's someone who looks very different than what it's I received. do. And it's received. Oh, that's so a great your idea. Your idea is stolen. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. yeah and, your idea is stolen. And so you're in that moment like, is this really happening? Right. By my goodness, it is. So, you know, it happens in subtle ways and then it happens in not so subtle ways. If you go to a job interview and, you know, as a professional, you're supposed to show your strength. But if you come and you are prepared, you know who you are, uh, you know your body of experience and that you can get the job done. Mm -hmm. For a black female, 
that is interpreted differently than were you a non-black yeah, female. I'm, I'm kind of mm -hmm. concerned about like resolutions to these type of things that people are experiencing. Like, um, you know, there's some people who um, have a mindset that seems to be very ignorant. And they'll say things like, well, if you don't feel comfortable, you leave. You don't have to work here. You know what I mean? You know, things right. like that. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, and, and, and I, I, you know, I, I, don't, I think people have heard people say things like that before, you know. So, you know, if, if this show does anything but to sensitize people mm -hmm. about the specific experiences that people who are of a diverse background or of a minority background or African American background and what we experience um, in engaging in this in our lives here in the United States of America in terms of being involved with um, uh, institutions and wanting to have gainful employment and right. and be our best selves and be our best persons and be employed in the United States of America there are certain things that and these are these seem like these are sociological things for the most part some of them inherit um, institutional things that need to be addressed and there needs to be some sensitivity to it so uh, my question is how do how do we resolve these type of situations in terms of you know because you can see all kinds of things happening I see horrific stories have been in the, in the news about individuals who experience certain things at the workplace mm -hmm. and their first thing is they resort to violence you know mm -hmm. that's what they do mm -hmm. they may not even be equipped with understanding and being civil in their response and saying, well, you know what, I'm going to pursue a legal uh, a way of dealing with this. There have been people, they're documented right here in the state of Connecticut. There's someone who uh, shot up a whole uh, a, a Coca-Cola uh, distrib right. distributor at one point, mm -hmm. if, you, if you recall. So what I'm saying is being the fact that, that mm -hmm. there are real people who are experiencing real things, right. what is the choice? Either you be a part of it. You'd I, be separate, you'd well, be separated, well, and, and you'd the, you'll, you'll go and back to is, uh, deseg be segregated. And, and that is the thing, because <clears> you <throat> are having a situation now where we, we think of, about Jim Crow and the history of Jim Crow, and it's seen sometimes so far-fetched and so far space. Like, we as a country would like to think have gone beyond that. But where we find ourselves is actually going back to that state of Jim Crow, because as a person of color, as a black individual, whether it be female, and I say black individual because the spectrum is, in terms of persons of color, ranges, but for spaces like Hartford, you're seeing something that I, I, I would classify as, as what a black out, which is mm -hmm. when you go to the classroom, um, you, there are not a lot of teachers of color. Um, there are not a lot of black teachers. When it's even lesser when it comes to black males. There are less black male in the school system. That's as teachers, that's as power, that's as, as all, well all as, across as the As well as administrators, right. so principals, I, I would, I would deans. Say exactly, all right. across the board. Chancellors. Right, you mm -hmm. see it in the public libraries. Um, you see it all across the board. So I will say it's having some sensitivity and intentionality. If you go to spaces like, say, Sinsbury or Avon, I guarantee you, you will not see a predominantly black work environment. However, you come to Hartford, you can have a school system where 95% are people of color. However, the reverse is exists in terms of the structure of employment, in terms of teachers and administration. And we've gotten to this place where there's a certain complacency so in order to get to a place where it, you know, there is what you like to say, some closure or not necessary closure, but resolution, resolution, mm -hmm. it has to be acknowledged. This is not, oh, it's all in your head. If you go to a space and you see where you have a classroom where a student, there are greatly students of color, and yet you can have a student who through his entire span through preschool, through high school, never come across a teacher of color or never come across a male teacher of color, that is something very wrong with that system. Right. So we have to approach it with intentionality. We have mentioned in the, um, the other uh, segment too that a lot of times the people who hold the, um, the positions of power 
okay, who are making the decisions of, let's say, the hiring or the inclusion of minorities or people diverse, they themselves represent a specific type of face, a mainstream face, which makes it even uh, more challenging and, um, and let's say, um, more difficult. You it see? does. And, and, um, and then we were talking a little bit, the first segment, about why, why is it that so many, um, there aren't that many minorities applying into the field of education? Does that have anything to do with the way the structure is set up, you know, and the experience that, that people of, of, of color and minorities experience at these places, at, at these institutions? So I think, Daryl, you have to look at it from yeah. kind of the broader perspective. In order for someone to be a teacher, they have to be taught first, right? They have to go through the school system, they have to learn what they need to learn, and then they need to be able to know that well enough to teach somebody else. So we have to go backwards a little bit and look at the school and the education system itself. If you are not educating blacks and minorities at the same level that you're educating other people, if they are lacking resources in the school district, if they are lacking teachers and uh, proper opportunities to learn and go out there, network, all of those things really matter, and then when you finally do you get someone that has an opportunity to teach it, they have to they have to want to be there number one mm -hmm. and number two they have to understand that it may not always be easy uh, the pay for school districts in Connecticut is very low and I think that that has a lot to do with our education funding system the Connecticut Supreme Court last year actually ruled on a case for the Connecticut Coalition of Education Funding versus REL and they talked about the entire Connecticut funding system and it's a fact that uh, school districts, specifically like Hartford and New Haven, receive less resources. And in turn, because of the population being more minorities, then that's less resources going to those minorities as well. And then going through the system, it makes it more difficult for them to even be educated and know that they can be greater and to want to give back to the system that helped bring them up, right? So if somebody went to a public school district here in Connecticut and they didn't feel like they learned what they needed to learn, if they didn't feel like they were supported, then why would they want to come back and, and, and teach? Why would they want to be associated right. with something that they didn't feel was, was useful for them? Now there's obviously plenty of people that do that and, and they come back because they want to make the system better. But in order to make something better, you have to acknowledge first that there's a problem and want to actually fix it. Exactly. I, I see it so often, specifically so in the law firms. There are so many firms that say, oh, we want to be diverse and inclusive. Absolutely, come work here. And then you get there and it's it's not a it's not an environment that's useful and conducive to you you have to really understand that my experience is going to be different from you and and you have to be open and willing and accept that and be willing to make some changes because until mm -hmm. we do that it's going to be a cycle one other question I have is uh, what factors of consideration do college admission boards consider to tilt the balance favorably to accepting non-white or minority applicants so specifically in higher education a lot of uh, Supreme Court cases recently discussed this issue. Uh, a lot of people know the, the case for Harvard that <laughs> came out uh, recently. Uh, and basically, the, the, what the law says currently is that you can use race as a factor in the higher admissions process. And the reason why that is, is because anytime you use race um, or anything that violates a fundamental right, the Supreme Court and the Constitution, specifically under the 14th Amendment, requires that you have to go through this test, and it's called strict scrutiny. The first factor of the strict scrutiny test says that you have to have a compelling state interest to use that resource, so in this case, race. That's the first step. And then, once you get over that hurdle, you also then have to have that use of race be narrowly tailored. And so what Supreme Court cases are saying is that a diverse student body is considered a compelling state interest. A lot of people can understand and recognize that you learn and you benefit from having other people that are different from you. That's law. The Supreme Court has agreed with that in Grutter versus Bollinger. The next step, though, is also about the use of race in the practices and it being narrowly tailored. If you don't have a compelling state interest or if you can't show mm -hmm. that what you're doing to help bring this diverse student body is narrowly tailored to that issue, they're going to say no. And there have been things that they have tried. Universities have done quotas. Universities have done the top 10%, which was used in Fisher versus Texas. And the Supreme Court is not always in agreement with that because it's not narrowly tailored to that issue. I personally believe that that 
creates an obstacle because in order for there to be more minorities, it, how else are you going to do that? Race has to be a factor. It has to be used. And so that's something that they've been doing. Um, and I think it works at least to some extent successfully, but there's a lot more that I think can be done to increase the diversity. Right, uh -huh. because in, you, is, you talk about having buy-in into something. Um, and a lot of a lot of places people are mistaken that when you say use and race, it's not, oh, you're black that you're going to get in. The discussion I often have with students, whether they be in middle school or high school and they're getting ready for the process of college admission is this. Race is a factor, but before you get to that, you have to you have to have the grades. You have to have the package. So and, and I think people get confused and it's like, oh, you're here because you're black. No, I'm here because I've earned it. Being black is incidental or being a person of color is antidote. It doesn't matter what color I am. I first have to have those grades. I first have to have the, 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 the package, whether it be, am I involved in my community? Do I volunteer? So even in situation where race involved, you're bringing to the table, you're at the table, you're present at the table because you've earned that. I still, even to this day when I talk to my children, because this, the race, they're often in spaces where they might be the only or one off, it's like, why is it I'm this? It's, it is the way it is systematically, but work on being present, work on being in the situation where you're doing what you need to to be at that table because exactly. race is a factor. It is the factor after you've earned the place at the table. Right. I'm not here necessarily because, because I'm black. Right. I'm here because I'm black in spite of being black. Right. And A lot of people assume that, that, that they make these uh, false assumptions, like you said. That, right. and that, it, that it, person is there simply because they got in. You've heard that before. Exactly. You got and in because and of the a, thing is, it's a not a, or a, 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 a law. That, a that, law that right, says you right. can come. And it's, it's not a one-way street. Um, research has test. shown mm -hmm. that there are benefits to having people who are of different backgrounds, who, whether it be, it's not just race, it's also so, socioeconomic standard, because that makes for a richer, if you're a part of an organization, that makes for a richer playing field in terms of but, having resolutions. But Ms. Goldby, what you were saying is that they're using, there are certain school districts and educational systems that are trying to say what Andrew is saying is not applicable to that environment. Right. right. They're using the law that way, right? Right, right. So there have been cases that are brought, and even in the case of Harvard, there are cases where they're saying there's <laughs> examples of reverse discrimination where Asian students are not being accepted into uh, certain higher education institutions, specifically in this case Harvard, and I believe the other one was uh, the University of North Carolina. And because of the practices that have been in place to, I guess, allow more minorities to be considered for admission, they're saying that that's a problem. And <laughs> I, I personally have issue with that. It's not, as Andrea said, it's not that you got in because you were black. You got in because you had the skills, you were capable of doing the work, but they considered the fact that you may have had barriers, you may have had obstacles and hurdles that you had to go over that somebody else that wasn't like you didn't have. Right. And that's important. Well, we appreciate mm -hmm. both your sentiments here. Uh, they're very, very, very insightful. I want to thank you, Ms. Goldsby, for being here, as well as you, uh, Ms. Mosquito. Thank you so much for being thank here. Candy for Conversations with Daryl. And we're, we're, going to make, we're going to go to a break right now here at Candy Conversations with Daryl for sure. Thank you. We'll be back after our break. How do you define evil? Is it the pedophile school administrator or taxation without representation? Is it the gatekeeping community leaders who sell out the very people they are fighting for? Or is evil the politician that puts out lies and takes in cash? However you may classify evil, having to choose the lesser of two evils still leaves you with evil. Nowhere does this rule apply more than during an election for mayor. Choosing a candidate that is the lesser of two evils still leaves you with evil. No wonder so many people don't vote. It's time for constituents to flip the script and vote for a mayor you can trust. My name is J. Stan McCauley. I approve this message and I am asking you for your vote on Tuesday, November the 5th, 2019 in the general election. 
I, like you, am an independent thinker. So let's sit down and talk about my path to victory and why my plan for Hartford will work. Stop listening to the uninformed evil interests that tell you I can't win. For more information, visit MacaulayForMayor.com. It's time to leave the plantation of party politics and free your political mind. You know something? Hartford's strength is the people. They're independent thinkers and love their city. So how did Hartford fall into the hands of rogue policymakers? Well, to start, this rogue group spent nearly one million dollars putting themselves on the inside and leaving you out in the cold. What if I told you that $5 can be the difference between a Hartford with hope and vision or a Hartford that is in perpetual decline, increasing crime, and an educational system going nowhere fast? Your $5 contribution to our team is a statement that you are investing in Hartford's future. Your $5 contribution to Macaulay for Mayor will make you a member of the team and together we will explore the possibilities. More than that, you will be demonstrating that Hartford's people are ready to make a stand with Stan. Our goal is to get the support of 5,000 people who live, work and play in Hartford. I'm asking you to make a bold statement by contributing five dollars right now, today. If you believe in Hartford and its people like I do, make that contribution. And together we will show Connecticut that the people of Hartford care enough to do our part. We are ready to pick up the ball and run. The people of Hartford are back in the game and we're in it to win. My name is Jay Sam McCauley, and I approve this message. Welcome back to Candid Conversation with Daryl Fitzgerald. We're going to continue our conversation as it relates to like social graces and inclusion and diversity uh, in different types of industries. Um, we're going to look at, uh, in this segment, um, inclusion and diversity in the uh, um, entertainment industry, which is like a whole different realm from, let's say, education um, and employment. I know we're trying to get through a lot of in uh, information, but you know we'll, we'll do our best. But, you know, uh, navigating the arts and entertainment industry has is, is been really, uh, it's very interesting because uh, it has pretty much, they're like rules, but then they're like no rules. The big question is like rules, but it's like no rules. And um, there may be a need for more, let's say, social graces uh, in, in the, in the uh, entertainment industry because uh, it's, it's a strange world. It's a very, very strange world. So as we look at how um, uh, minorities, uh, 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 people of color, are included or accepted, it's really interesting to see what type of social behaviors and how people interact in the, uh, in the uh, entertainment industry itself. A lot of it can be based on uh, nepotism, um, a lot of um, narcissism, a lot of, uh, you know, the, you being, like, for the sake of being who you are or, let's say, being a brand or um, it's all about you. You know, it's all about that, that particular entity or that brand. And you find that there's not a lot of times a lot of integrity, you know, in right. terms of dealing with the um, the business deals. You know, like people will start out one way uh, and then change kind of like midstream. Mm -hmm. uh, say that they're going to work with you one way and then all of a sudden for whatever reasons, and respectfully so, everybody has their reasons for whatever they do. But it, it, it's, it's so much... Um, I would say strangeness, right. and I don't. I don't know if, if you know. You you have some background, Mr. Harris, in um, in, in entertainment world, somewhat. Actually, I am a poet and a writer. 
Um, I perform mm -hmm. at different open mics and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, and I also, I have a lot of friends now who are hip hop artists, singers, actors, um, doing di very various things. But as far as social graces um, regarding the entertainment industry, just like you said, there's rules, but there's no rules. Like there's rules that, that they take as m business morals in a way, but that they don't have to follow. And when they choose not to, they don't follow them because it's, it's not, beneficial right. Right. most beneficial to them um, whereas you, you have know, an example we'll let um, you look at Bill Cosby you know and the stuff that happened to him you look at um, and be specific what do you mean um, so Bill Cosby in the entertainment industry was looking to purchase um, CBS. CBS and that alone would have elevated the state of mm -hmm. African-American people because it would have gave us another channel, not saying that he would have made that, you know, like a secondary BET, but I'm sure it would have been geared more to showing real things, real information about African American people and other minorities versus just mm -hmm. seeing Caucasians on TV everywhere. I remember when I was young, watching TV and seeing all these white people on TV, not really seeing black people on TV, it made me feel you know, more right. like, okay, white people must be okay, you know? And we must And not black be. people must not right. be, you know? And that's me as a black child thinking this. And I didn't know any better. I'm seeing, I'm learning from television. I grew up in foster homes, so that television was more of my adult, my parent, than anybody else. And at the same time, you're accepting, like, it's like we, we actually accept all that imagery. Exactly. You know, and, and as, as, as if we're included, too, and we're accepting. And it's interesting as we get older and we start to like go into the workforce and different things like that, and we find even more hostilities. And despite the fact that maybe, let's say, you accept all the, you accept the mainstream, you want to be involved, you want to be integrated, you want to play your role. Right. And then for, let's say, competitive reasons, competitive reasons, where let's say people who see you as a threat or may not want you to have an opportunity or have you have you have the job that they want would have or yeah. you're experiencing this hostility but and, and not only is it coming from them cuz now for those same reasons that I just described right. to you about myself being a young child a young black child and and now seeing Perception. white people on TV now I'm like oh white people must be better right so now if I get into a place where there's a majority of white coworkers and I'm like, wow, I'm the man, I'm the guy, I'm, I'm him here, you know? Now they say, oh, well, now we're looking to hire <laughs> I must, another I black guy. I must be guy. special. Right, I must be special. Now they're looking to hire another black guy. Oh, no, you can't hire him because I'm the special one, you know? Okay. Because if you hire him, then I'm watered down a little bit. Or, My but really, what I bring to the table, right, yeah. Is, is not as important anymore because now you have somebody else who looks like me and you're gonna be running to them for the ideas that you would've came to me for. Right. So now, not only are they keeping you down, now me, Uncle Tom, I'm keeping you down because I don't want you here. I'm the crab in the barrel that is keeping you down on the bottom of the barrel because if I can't, and I can't rise above because I'm not letting my other people come in and rise up. Right. So we can rise together and not necessarily take over, but show our true value collectively. Yeah, and it, it goes to opportunity. It, we get to a space where we're, we, we, and when I say we, it's, it's not, it's, it's also people of color, where we're, we're so used to the idea of what is right and the concept of white being right. Yeah. Um, I, I remember when I was in college and um, a, fr a, friend of I, a, friend of my, a friend of mine that I dormed with, um, she, said, she said to me, um, I, don't, you, you, I don't see you as black. That's interesting. Um, and I said, what do you mean you don't see me as black? She says, well, you don't act black, you don't sound black, you don't dress yeah. black. But does I she said, see the color of your skin? I said, have you looked at me? Yeah. Um, you know, there are rare occasions where it gets darker than me. How can you not see that? She says, well, I mean, I know you, I know, I know, but, you know, you don't act the way black people are supposed to. And then, so I just posed this question because, you know, Pardon my ignorance. How are black people supposed to act? Right. Um, well, you know, the men, their pants, they dress with their pants hanging. 
um, you know, the woman, they're loose or they don't speak the way you do or they don't have the same social graces. And I said, and where did you get this misconceived perception from? She says, well, and she was from Iran, you know. Mm -hmm. She says, well, when I watch TV, you know, all the black people yeah. I saw. Right. They did not look like you. That's so, so that's why I don't see you as black. So because she did not see me as black, she had more of a comfort level right. with associating herself. I, I, you know, you talk about feeling certain comfort with people who look more like you. It, that's why it has to come with intentionality that you know the value of working with or being in a space with someone who is not like you, maybe don't look like you, but you can still work together. There's, there's, still, there's added value because of that. Um, I've had people who said, I, I remember going to dance and there was this, um, this male, he was not a person of color and he said, I had straightened my hair and, um, you know, because at that point I didn't realize, I realize now is that when you're put in certain spaces, it's almost like you have to affirm your blackness by doing certain things. And for me, that was by wearing an Afro. Right, right. And so this person was not a person of color. I flat iron my my hair, and I have what you might call a prep uniform, my nice skirt and shirt and sweater. And he was wowed. He said, "Oh my God, you're beautiful!" And yeah. I was quite taken aback. I it's said, "It's interesting." I said, "What do you?" The mean? struggle is real. You know, the struggle is what real. We're mean? we're constantly constantly yeah. having to deal with um, different types of um, perceptions conceptualizations that people have about ourselves, about who we, who we are and right. as a people. And a lot of it is loaded in other people's um, sort of um, in, you know, ignorance. Yes. Or the fact that they haven't had a certain kind of a experience right. or because a certain straight, kind of an exposure. Yeah, straight hair made um, me beautiful. You know, I remember being very young and um, you know, I went to um, a lot of predominantly, you know, I went to public school, but I also went to a lot of predominantly um, uh, mixed schools and predominantly um, white schools. and. Um, and I remember an experience I had where I was in a cafeteria and uh, these guys, they just kept coming up to me and they were like, yo, what's up, D? What's up? What's up? What's up? Like, they were talking to me like that. And I'm like, and I looked at them, I was like, this They're is kind of weird. Like, why are you talking to me like this? Like, you know, I don't that talk perception. like that. I don't speak like that. But in their minds, in their perspective, that's who I was, and they were, you know, they were just trying to uh, make connect. a connection with me. You know to what I mean? Connect. No harm, in, no harm from yeah. them, no harm intended on them. They wanted, they wanted to befriend me. We, they wanted to be friends with me. You know, you ever had a situation where people just start putting their fingers all in your hair? I've never oh, touched, yes. I never touched, right. you know, so right. I never touched yeah. black hair before. You know, I don't. Know. Let Can me I see how it, it feels. Can no. I touch you? So what I'm trying to say, we don't want to, <laughs> like, we don't want to discourage, we don't want to discourage. You know what I'm saying? People who literally have a genuine interest right. In, right. in sort of like making that connection and learning and being others. able to yeah right. to connect and right. learn but we but but also be sensitive to um, we hope that you be sensitive to the experiences that we're having right because the way as, you do we, everything. as we all try to connect and work together to, to make this society a better place for mm -hmm. everybody to yes. live for everyone. Uh, and on that note uh, we ran out of time here can't conversation with Daryl Cyril but I do hope that some of the insights that um, uh, came out were very helpful to you uh, as we work toward um, humanizing uh, this world that we live in and in, in, my, in closing I just want to say that um, by holding back anyone you will hold back yourself yes. and hold back the progress of our world and we reject inequality, we reject ill-treatment, we reject disrespect, and illegal discriminatory practices. So I just want to thank you for uh, tuning in to another episode of Candid Conversations with Daryl Fitzgerald. Thank See you. you next time. Yeah, 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 yeah. A king, a king, a king. I'm the greatest, the greatest. I'm the greatest. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I said, yeah, yeah, said, yeah. I'm a king, a king, I'm nigga. A king. I'm the greatest, the greatest. I'm, the greatest. I'm a great man, great I'm man. A great man. I, said, yeah, yeah. I said, yeah, yeah. I'm a king, a king, I'm nigga. A king. I'm the greatest, the greatest. I'm the greatest. I'm a great man, a great man. I'm a great man. Yeah, yeah, yeah.